The next item is Executive Report Number 2. I now call on Councillor Govindia to move reception of that report and Councillors Carpenter and Belton to move their amendment, which relates to an addition to paragraph 1. Councillor Govindia. Councillor Carpenter. Formally move the amendment. Yeah, yes, it's done. Seconded by Councillor Belton. Thank you. Can we move on. Yeah, finance. finance and corporate resources, OSC. Councillor Senior. Paragraph one. Thank you. Councillor Carpenter. To speak. Yeah. Councillor Carpenter, to speak. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillors will have seen our amendment to uh, the report expressing concern at the 51% reduction in the revenue support grant over the planned period and calling for the government to uh, mitigate its effects. I'd hope that this is something that both sides of the chamber could support. Mr. Mayor, Wandsworth Tories have long trumpeted their financial competence based on a single year lost in the midst of time in which they set a zero council tax. Over the past years, when I've been opposition finance speaker, I have certainly been obliged to undermine that reputation by drawing attention to Wandsworth Tories' current performance. This year, my task is made even easier. The facts are laid out clearly on page 39 of your papers. This year, the council is proposing to draw 24 million pounds from reserves to balance its budget. Its current account deficit is nearly 12% of its £205 million pound budget. When the Labour government ran a 10% budget deficit as a result of the great global banking crisis, I recall members opposite saying that the Labour government was financially incompetent. Indeed, some members opposite persist in parroting such accusations this day. I just hear them. <laughs> Will they now call for the resignation of councillors Senior and Govindia, who presided over this gross financial incompetence, with the council living 12% beyond its financial means? The Greeks have got a better record on financial management. Perhaps the majority party should take some lessons from them. If we turn to their proposals for the coming financial year of 2017 to 18, it's scarcely any better. They are currently proposing an 8.6 million, or 5% budget deficit. And this deteriorates to 12.2 million, or 7%, in 2018 to 19. What the actual outcomes will be is anyone's guess, given that this year the original budget has been increased by some 13 million, or 7%. What is the reason for this financial incompetence? I won't dwell on the consequences of the unsatisfactory Ofsted report on children's services, which led the majority party to set up a 14.5 million provision for the costs entailed in putting things right. What I will say is that the current level of spending on children's services is rapidly depleting this provision and is unsustainable in the medium term. In my 50 years of business experience, I have found that it's rarely sensible to leave it to the people who have made the mess to clear it up. New brooms sweep clean. It's an indication of the leader's weakness that he failed to replace the responsible cabinet member. We are now beginning to see the mounting financial consequences of that poor decision. So, Mr. Mayor, what will we do differently when we take over the council next year? At the March Council meeting, we will set out our proposals in more detail in the debate on council tax. However, it's quite clear to me that if Wandsworth is to maintain and improve the level of services it provides its residents, then it needs to generate more revenue, but not from council tax. Currently, Wandsworth gets interest of around 1% on its cash balance of some £500 million. By contrast, the Wandsworth Pension Fund generates returns of some 5%. I believe that we could substantially raise the return on our cash reserves while mitigating the risk of capital losses by appropriate hedging strategies. Wandsworth also generates significant 
proportion of its revenue from charges. Some of these are specified by government, but some aren't, like parking charges. We could follow Westminster with a premium parking charge for diesel vehicles. This would, could raise us up some five million for a start, would help us to reduce pollution. There is also scope for further efficiency savings through joint working with other boroughs. We have long argued that Merton and Lambeth are more logical partners than Richmond, and in power, we will explore the possibility of extending the joint staffing arrangements with Richmond and Merton to Merton and Lambeth. If that can be brought to fruition, we would expect greater efficiency savings than the 10 million per annum currently anticipated from the joint working with Richmond. Mr. Mayor, a combination of revenue growth and efficiency savings will enable us to invest in the education and children's services, adult social care, and community services that our residents demand. This is the alternative we offer to the debt by a thousand cuts imposed over the years by the failed financial policies of Wandsworth Tories. Thank you. Councillor Petergen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, before, I, before I start on the substantive thing, I'd, I'd, I'd like to assure Councillor Gibbons that I have no idea what a Guido Fawkes is. Um, is it painful? Um, I, 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 I want to start tonight just by addressing uh, a, few a few of the points, well, at least one of the points that Councillor Carpenter made. If he thinks he's got an easy job undermining our record um, of economic competence, judging by the uh, job, job he's doing it at the moment, perhaps he should be the one to resign because he's not being terribly successful. Um, I'm agog to hear uh, the plans that he's going to be bringing forward in March. Uh, always with Labour, it's jammed tomorrow because the amendment that stands this evening uh, in the names of Councillors Carpenter and Belton is thing at best, so I can keep my remarks relatively brief. The amendment really stands as shorthand for the opposition's approach to so much of what we do in this building. They carp, they whine, they moan, they grousel, always problems, never solutions. A permanent protest group. Uh, tonight they're trying to blame uh, the government. Um, they, they, they always look forward to it, so I, I, I like to satisfy them. It suits them to overlook the catastrophic structural damage done to the public finances by the last Labour government, which was still in the process of fixing. Every single council in the country is dealing with funding challenges, and few are, so well, are as well managed and better able to deal with those challenges, both in terms of executive and in terms of senior staff, as this one. Uh, during uh, the course of this council term, amongst other measures, we've implemented a groundbreaking shared services arrangement with Richmond, um, which is projected to save ones with taxpayers £10 million. Pounds. Uh, what has been the opposition response? Grandstanding, knee-jerk opposition, and always these vague plans uh, to do something uh, with Merton uh, and Lambeth. They're never quite specific as to what. They have, however, come round recently, I think, to a sullen acceptance. The fact is, Mr Mayor, that it's difficult to imagine the opposition coming up with any innovative pro proposal on the borough's finances. I've been here for three years now, and I'm still none the wiser as to what their approach might be. I live in hope. Uh, for the March meeting. Um, their approach uh, is really one of permanent protest, as I've already mentioned. Um, the contributions this evening from uh, Councillor Carpenter, although he promises uh, that we will hear something from him, have not really provided any sort of illumination. Now, they might think, Mr Mayor, that if they try to avoid putting up any sort of specifics, they can avoid those being shredded. Everyone else inside and outside this chamber just thinks they've got something to hide. So the 2018 election, uh, which Councillor Carpenter referred to, is uh, going to be, in the words of the great Ronald Reagan, a time for choosing, uh, a time for the electorate to choose uh, who they want in charge of the borough's finances. Do they want a Labour Party uh, who seem to think that running a town hall is very much like running a student union on taxpayer funds, uh, and which is increasingly uh, dominated by its hard left? Uh, or do they want a Conservative Party that's tried and tested, with a track record of delivering high quality services whilst keeping taxes as low as possible? Mr Mayor, uh, acceptance of the amendment tonight would constitute the, the, the Council's complicity uh, in the, op uh, the opposition's ongoing dereliction in this regard, and so I recommend uh, reception of the report unamended to the Council. Councillor Critchard. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I always find it interesting listening to Councillor Peterkin practising his uh, loyally statements. Um, I'm just going to point out to people, this is the budget paper 
for 2017-18 and it outlines the budgets for the subsequent years. One thing I'd say to you all is when you talk about budgets, it's really easy to forget what the budgets do. This is the money that pays for the, chil for the children's social workers. This is the money that pays for older people's social care. This is the money that pays for the rubbish to be collected and for the streets to be cleaned and for the library services, the swimming pools and the playing fields. This is the money that pays for the services that people expect from their local authority and the money that we can also use to make people's lives better. Uh, Mr. Mr Mayor, I just would like members who are in the chamber to have a look at page 38 of the budget paper. I guess I should ask that through you, given the protocol. Thank you. Just so you know, the budget predictions for the next three years effectively come out at about £171 million, which implies that's what Wandsworth think we need to run the services here, to a satisfactory standard. However, in 2016-2017, we spent 205 million, that's 13 million more than was expected on the initial budget, and 25 million more than we think we need in 2017-18. So I, and a few others, am a bit sceptical that the budget that's proposed will actually work. At the same time, the revenue support grant is diminishing from 46 million this year year down to 23 million in 1920. So that's a known funding gap of 23 million pounds in the revenue to find. And if the budget predictions are not correct, as they weren't last year, then we could be finding up to another 25 million pounds, as we had to do, I've had to do this year. This paper gives no indication about how to fund this other from reserves. 12 million pounds has already gone in, another 12 million pounds scheduled. And this assumes the council can live within its straightened budget and that there are no more in this series of unfortunate events such as the poor Ofsted and the extra funding necessary for lack children. Reserves don't last forever. As you can remember, we get 1%, we get £5 million pounds per annum into our revenue from our reserves. But if we take them out at £50 million a year, we are diminishing the reserve very quickly and what we cannot do is use the reserve for other projects. Councillor Anne Bash particularly mentioned health inequalities and the joint um, strategic needs assessment. That's the sort of money that if we had extra money and were not drawing down reserves we could use our reserves for. All the cuts in grants are Tory government policies. Uh, sorry, excuse me, Mr Mayor, I thought that we were suggesting that members should be, and I hope this isn't taken off my time, that members should be listening to other members, and I would appreciate, especially if other members in this debate weren't on their mobile phones as I'm talking, I feel that is slightly Thank not you. quite in the spirit. I hope you will agree with me. Thank you, that. noted. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Pick up from here. Carry on. All the cuts are from... Tory government policies. The policies mean our services are cut and stretched. Social care is funded currently at a minimum level. We talked about that last time. And it's possible that Wandsworth may not be able to find a social care provider without paying more in the future. We have a homelessness crisis as people are evicted from private rented accommodation that the council has to deal with, providing a taxpayer subsidy to private landlords. I don't believe a responsible council can see all this happen and fail to challenge the Tory government on these policies. When will Wandsworth tell the government to improve conditions in the private rented sector so councils don't have to subsidise poor quality accommodation? When will Wandsworth tell the government that cuts mean the council will not be able to give excellent services to its most needy residents? When will Wandsworth demand the government review the council tax to increase the ban so people with higher value properties I will be one of them, pay more. Or better still, look at ways to fund, us, fund services and shift the tax burden to those better able to pay, such yeah, as yeah. myself. When will Wandsworth stop taking all government cuts lying down and letting the government walk all over the councils? Council services are most important to poor and vulnerable residents, children, old people, those without a secure tenancy, all those people a caring society should be looking after and supporting. Sorry. 
My own China. <laughs> Not bad, almost got there. <laughs> Sorry, if I hadn't had to make a mistake, I hadn't had to make a comment about other members, I could have managed it in time. Almost there. Yes, Councillor, um, your, your phone is working. I was just going to reiterate what the Mayor's chaplain had said. Can you conclude now? Yes, absolutely. Um, these policies are something that you can change. My question is, do you, as members opposite, have the courage to take on your own government and change them? Well done. <laughs> Councillor Belton, now you have agreed to allow Councillor Belton up to 10 minutes. No, I probably won't use it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, um, and I very much appreciate Councillor Critchard's comments, which uh, chimed somewhat with mine. Um, I wanted a debate particularly on this tonight. Um, I think it's possibly because of my pressing in the Labour group that we've got it, uh, because I want to just talk about the issue of local government funding uh, a bit more. I don't personally have any objection to the words in the paper or to any of the figures because as uh, Mr. Buss will be the first to point out, they're factual statements of the situation we're in. So that's fine. But for many years, uh, everyone in local government in this country has known that there's been a serious problem with the fact that local government doesn't actually fund itself and it doesn't know how to tackle that as an issue. Uh, revenue support grant all comes centrally. Um, business rates don't have a great deal to do with the local authority and indeed council tax has been nationalised since uh, about 2002 and we've had a, a percent change here and a percent change there but we have to go through hoops of referenda and we all know how dangerous they are, uh, hoops of referenda to change it in any substantial way. So we're in this strange position but everyone thinks that uh, local authorities should be responsible in some way for their tax base, but every government takes away that ability time after time. And that's true of Labour governments, just as much as Tory governments. I'm really not making a party political point at that particular point anyway. So I wonder what we're going to do about it. <laughs> you know, some time back there were local taxes, um, Funnily enough, the old domestic rates were much less regressive than the council tax, but you know, we get to the most regressive of all, the uh, community charge gets stopped by the public. The second most regressive council tax, and that's sufficiently bad that the uh, government has nationalised it and uh, not allowed you to raise it. So the problem's been accepted on both sides and no one's done anything about it. Until, to be fair, the Cameron government comes up with a radical alternative, and I mean radical. And its radical alternative is just to abolish funding. Now, isn't that extraordinary? Just abolish it with nothing to put in its place. And so, hence the extraordinary line which Councillor Critchard's already referred to, by the reduction in revenue support grant going from whatever it was, a very substantial amount of our funding, to nothing in 2020. I can remember when that was first announced, Councillor Senior, I'd be interested to hear what he has to say about this, uh, saying with shock, uh, revenue sports grant is going to go. I mean, just what are we going to do in five or six years' time? And then, of course, this council, and I'm being a bit party political here, um, this council was all in favour of bringing back business rates locally. Um, I argued right from the beginning that this seemed to me a very dangerous step to take because if it meant anything, there had to be an equalisation scheme. And uh, uh, if, there wasn't an equ if there was an equalisation scheme, why not keep it as it was? If there was uh, no equalisation scheme, then boroughs like Westminster, Camden, the City of London, um, and one or two others, like Basingstoke and Bromley, growth areas, would be doing brilliantly. And those with a low business base which happened to be Wandsworth at the time, would be in real trouble. And that's talking about the rich southeast, of course. When you put that on a national scale, you think, what on earth is going to happen to Wall's End and Warsaw when uh, Basingstoke and Barking, uh, Barking's got growth potential, uh, are boosted by, 
by the business rate. Now, the government gets around this to a certain extent um, in our particular case by introducing the new homes bonus funding. And that's quite big. It's quite big right here in Wandsworth because we happen to be really lucky. It's quite big right now in Wandsworth because there's a lot of development in Nine Elms. But none of us surely believes that's the basis of secure uh, local government funding forever. That new homes funding that was last five, six years, someone tell me, something like that, um, for, on these developments. So when that great building boom of the Nine Elms Lane ends, add five years, and that's gone. Now, we're lucky, at least we've got those five years, ten years. Uh, many, many boroughs in the country don't have it at all. Just what are they going to do? Don't, it's not surprising that authorities in the north of the country are squealing. We are really hyping up the divide between the rich south and the poor north. We are emphasizing it like crazy, and many people here from the north, as many of us are from the north originally, know that from the trips we make home occasionally. What are we hyping ourselves up for, to be? Now, this has all kinds of peculiar effects. The freeze on council tax, ironically, is really bad for Wandsworth because uh, our council tax brings in so little because we're frozen at a low, historically low council tax level. Uh, it brings in quite a small amount. So our frozen council tax, I don't know the exact figure, but you know the bandies in Richmond and Lambeth as well as I do. So if they're, if they're both frozen at the same level, they're getting two or three times as much income per year as we are. So on a revenue level, it's hitting us really badly, but on a capital level, it's a completely different ball game. This has all sorts of peculiar ramifications, and Nine Elms one of them. It's made our planning system, um, from my pains, I sit on the Planning Applications Committee, uh, really more like an oriental bazaar than part of a planning system. It's very difficult to persuade Joe Public, incredibly difficult to persuade Joe Public, that because um, they, the developers, are prepared to spend N million of building a school, they should be allowed a 42-story block uh, filled by hotels and incredibly expensive property in Nine Elms Lane. In my case, only a couple of weeks ago, they, the developers, can put 14-story block on a site, actually not much bigger than this council chamber, let's be honest, not much bigger than this council chamber. They can put it on that site if they build a new sports hall for the local school. Um, you try and persuade the neighbours sitting under that 14-story that uh, we aren't selling council, we aren't selling planning permissions. It's actually quite a hard sell. And, you know, I tried occasionally, so no, no, this is part of planning benefits. Um, what's the difference? It, it is extraordinarily difficult. We're doing that everywhere. And we're doing it quite deliberately because the government's basing the whole of the future of the taxation system on encouraging business and residential growth in a particular area, which is great if you happen to be on the growth side of that spectrum. If you're not on the growth side of that spectrum, and obviously... 50%, say, of local authorities in this country are not. I just want to question, not about Wandsworth, because we're not doing too badly, but in general, the philosophical basis of uh, what local taxation means for the government. And I don't think Cameron and his successors actually have one. Um, it's just a deal between uh, developers in this at, at capital level and uh, uh, difference in other areas, of course. Another example, for example, is a fundamental belief in this council that we ought to charge the cost rate of services. Now, that's stated quite frequently in some areas, and if you pursue that logic all the way through, uh, charge the cost rate of refuse collection, go back to the 19th century, then, then why not? Except, of course, the poor will refuse to pay it and won't dispose of their refuse, and you'll have all sorts of problems. Societal problems, public health consequences happen if you charge the real rate. And what worries me is 
from what I saw, I'm sorry to be political about it here, a social democratic system of regulation and planning in the country. We're becoming a purely business-oriented, private sector-driven society. How can we expect the private sector to regulate itself in a way that makes sense for us all? Another trivial example, you can now have building regulations done by yourself. You, you, you don't have to have a, an official independent building regs person from Wandsworth Council to tell you whether your building is safe. You can hire your own to tell you it's safe. That sounds like the way of Bangladeshi factories to me, and it's not the system that I grew up with and not the system I, I like. So whilst I'm not criticizing this council at all for the letters and the figures in this document, I criticize it absolutely, along with Councillor Prick Richard, who said it so well, that I haven't heard a single word from them saying to the government, we still haven't sorted out any system at all for local government come 2020. By the way, the same year when revenue support go goes, when the business rates are all localised, the same year as Brexit and a general election. Does anyone imagine this is all going to work in three years and be organised? I, for one, am rather scared that it won't. Councillor Senior. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, if I could just make a couple of specific uh, responses to some of the points that have been raised, because first of all, I would like to say, just this once, just this once, I agree with Councillor Belton, uh, because he is quite right in any system of re localisation retention of business rates that does need to be some system to equalise between them, because otherwise the bearers such as Camden and Westminster will charge their residents absolutely nothing, in fact they'll probably be giving them checks, whilst other bearers, particularly the smaller rural authorities, which may have very few businesses, perhaps businesses where one closing would be an enormous impact on their business rates, uh, would uh, suffer greatly. We don't know what that is to be yet. Uh, there's all sorts of uh, technical consultation going on to which the Council has responded. Likewise, a new homes bonus. Yes, uh, we all know that cannot last forever, although it is very useful at the time being. And we all know the problems that it creates in the planning system, with the impression that is given, the impression that is given, I, I stress that, that the uh, permissions are somehow for sale. Now we can see why right, some of the very big applications were rejected that quite clearly isn't the case. Well, I can't blame local people for getting that impression. Now, Councillor Carpenter mentioned investment income. Well, the key thing in this is, is it's important to keep our reserves safe. And that's why some of the time we do have to put them in low yielding but very safe methods. We are looking at other methods. I'll be bringing some proposals probably forward at the next meeting uh, whereby we can get more yield. And we're also investing considerable amounts of money in commercial property, which we believe to be safe, but gives us in appropriate circumstances a yield of 5 or 6%. And likewise, yes, of course, we will be looking at charges, as we always do, to see whether there may be circumstances where more income could be raised. But what I want to say in general is there are some areas of public life in, in this country where somehow we fail to have a discussion. Uh, an example, nothing to do with this council, is the health service. If you mention anything about health service funding, you'd like to be immediately told you're privatising it or cutting it or charging for the health service. That's the immediate and knee-jerk reaction. There are other areas of public policy I could talk about as well. But when it comes to balancing the budget, we have an almost similar sort of thing. We have the left saying it's outrageous, it's, it's appalling austerity, and the right muttering away, well, we need to balance the budgets, and not really say why that happens to be. This is, of course, an enormous example of inter intergenerational injustice. That we are all have governments for many years which have borrowed large amounts of money, have kicked the ball down the road to future generations, perhaps not even born yet, have got to pay because we haven't actually come up with a way of balancing our budgets. That must be fundamentally wrong. But if you look at what happens, now back in the 1970s, we had a Labour government where the Chancellor of the Exchequer wanted to um, squeeze the rich until the pips, something or other. And, uh, uh, and uh, what, what, look what happened then. I see, may well be some members of the Labour group are still in favour of, of squeezing the rich like that. Well, actually, the amount of money we raised from the rich taxpayers went down. But in fact, the total amount of taxation we raised at that time in proportion uh, to our GDP was about 38 or 39 percent. So that would give us some indication that even if you tax very highly, 
of what the sort of levels of public expenditure can be going forward. And of course, at the moment, although levels of public expenditure compared to our GDP are falling, we're still slightly above uh, that level. And it's going to be take some time further. And that's where local government comes into it, because there's no doubt we have been very hard hit uh, by the government. They've taken local government across the piece as an easy target. We, we have uh, uh, that wonderful man, Mr Pickles, who used to come up with all sorts of bizarre propaganda stories about what councils do, do whilst at the same time cutting our money to do anything. And it is certainly not the case that this council and other people have been slow in coming forward in making that point. I have certainly made some very robust comments to the media over the years uh, about this very issue that we are taking an exceptionally hard uh, hit where many other parts of the public sector have of course been protected. Not the case with us. Thankfully though, in this council at least, we've got the ability to withstand that for the time being. Because we've been prudent and careful over the years, we've built up reserves. And that means we are not setting a deficit budget. We are able to set a balanced budget as we must do. We are able to do that because of the, way, the sensible way in which this council has been run for many, many years, and I trust will continue to run for many years to come. The amendment moved by Councillor Carpenter and seconded by Councillor Belton uh, will take a, a vote. On that. Yeah. Uh, those in favour of the amendment? How many? How many percent? 18. And those against? Thirty-three against. And now we move to the, and now we move to the motion that paragraph one be received as information. Those in favour. Those in favour. Is it the same numbers? Same numbers. Yeah. So that's Thank you. Uh, no, no. no. So we okay. We need Take a fresh vote then. Keep your hands up. Those in favour. Those in favour. Hands up. Those against? 16. Yeah. 16. Thank you. 16. Yeah, 16. 16. So it's carried 35, 16. It's carried 35, 16.